All right, let's kick this off. Um, first, we'll start with a brief introduction to Endo. We have Photoshop open with our Quixel Suite open here as well. When you launch the Quixel Suite application um, in, in Windows, you it will automatically launch Photoshop for you. Alternatively, you can open Photoshop and then um, activate the suite. It doesn't really matter. Uh, to start Endo, you select the purple N icon here, and the application will launch. So, and this is a create new project window here where you have the option to set your texture size which in our case 1024 by 1024 is fine um, it's for a, uh, a relatively small object 16-bit image is good because that gives you more um, color information a greater color range to work from and so for normal maps it gives you a cleaner and more accurate result um, select output path I've found with Endo doesn't always work um, as I expect. So, for example, you're supposed to be able to select a folder here where you want this new project to be automatically saved to. Whenever I enter a path of my own, it will save it um, wherever, it, uh, in another location, basically. Um, when, and I can show you that in a minute. So basically, I don't think this function works at the moment. Maybe it'll be fixed later. So with these settings in place, we'll select the Create New Project option. And here you have it. Um, the uh, Endo auto automatically will create a parent folder called Normal um, with a top layer that's essentially, it, it just appears to be a color overlay which will give all of the um, the folders in the in the uh, the layers beneath it um, a tangent space normal coloring which which is important. It doesn't provide any gradient information, all that's provided um, by the layers beneath it. It'll just overlay. That, that's what I think it is. Point being, you need to make sure this layer is active and any work that you do is between um, this bottom layer and this top one. This bottom layer is essentially, it just appears to be a flat fill layer. So you don't have to fill every portion of your document with a normal um, with normal information. You can paint wherever you want and wherever you don't paint, you'll have a flat normal layer. And, uh, in tangent space words, essentially what that means is um, on your 3D mesh, there'll be there'll be no details. It, it won't look strange. Um, it'll just be a flat surface. Okay. Make sure they're both engaged and you do your work between. Now, if you have Photoshop CS6 or later, I believe um, you can use the new Add New Multi Normal option. Uh, I don't know if the option is available if you have CS earlier than CS6, um, but I did read in the manual at one point this. Um, this feature was only available for CS6 or newer. And what it does, it'll, it'll create a folder uh, structure very quickly, and it'll allow you to um, have uh, to use smart objects or, in, in most cases, vector shapes to quickly create um, unique designs. Essentially, you, with a vector shape in Photoshop, if you're not using pixels, if you're using the shape form, and I'll get into that in a minute, you can add shapes, subtract from shapes, and create unique designs. And that's the benefit of using this feature. You can do all that uh, very quickly. In this older legacy version, um, you can use black and white grayscale to create depth images. Um, if you used shapes, you had to rasterize them, basically convert them to pixel information first, um, which can be sort of a destru uh, destructive workflow. And I'll, I'll show you why, uh, what I mean by that in a minute. So in our case, I'm going to focus on using the new multi-normal option. Okay, so here we go. Um, automatically, um, Endu will create it, uh, all of these this, this folder structure for me. And these folders, we don't need to mess with at all. That's just part of the program. Um, where you want to um, create your work and store your work within this parent folder is in this um, normal layer here. Or You can add as many layers above it as you would like, as long as they stay beneath these folders. And that's a great feature. Um, you can rename the parent folder to whatever you prefer. Um, so in, in a minute we'll do that once we decide on what kind of shape we want. Right now, in this video, we'll just cover some basics of, of normal drawing and then viewing them in Endo. So let me select this layer here and I'm going to use um, a tool that I use quite often in the program. It's just, uh, the shape tool. So you have rectangles, rounded rectangles, which essentially are, are beveled or rounded corners. An ellipse tool, which can be uh, an ellipse or a circle. The polygon tool, which can be a polygon of any number of sides. And then the line tool. Custom shapes allows you to import uh, different shapes if you need to use them. We'll just use the rounded rectangle here first and I'll simply left click and drag some normal detail there and you see a raised normal uh, surface. 
Um, and that's by default what uh, Endu will create for you when you, you uh, create a new layer. So here in the slant option, you have the option of uh, moving uh, the normal direction up or down. So when I select down, you're going to see the normal direction changed here. Um, and it's probably, if, if, you're, if you're new to tangent space normal maps and this doesn't really make uh, a lot of sense to you and it's not clear and you want to see it on a 3D mesh, that's where 3Do, the, um, the, the it's a free part of the suite when you buy Endu or Dedu. Um, this really comes in handy when you want to view this on a mesh. So we'll select the blue number 3. It'll launch their 3D viewer here. And immediately you will not see the normal map applied. You have to select the refresh button here in the Endu window. And it may take a moment to send, but there you go. There's our uh, there's our normal information. If you don't like the de default sphere, you can pick another uh, primitive if you like. You can use a plane. Let me zoom out. You can use a cylinder. Let me zoom out. And uh, there is an option for a, for a default mesh, and we'll get to that in a minute, and uh, probably in the next video when we load our our custom asset. Um, we'll stick with the uh, with the cube for now. Okay, you have different uh, options here in 3D, and, the, and the, the way that I brought up that dialog box was selecting the spacebar when this um, video, um, sorry, when this window is active. Um, here you have an option of changing the, the light intensity of the, um, of the image that's, that's used to provide light, and what they use is high dynamic range images which are surrounding uh, this object. Basically, it's, uh, it's the background. You can view the image by deselecting Use Backdrop here. I'll hide the menu with Spacebar, and you can see the, uh, the HDR image behind the object when you zoom out. If you want to change the orientation of the HDR image to say um, change the hotspots on your mesh so you can view your normals and your bevels more clearly, just hold the shift button and use left mouse button to drag back and forth like that. Normally I will hide the backdrop because it's a little distracting for me sometimes with uh, the colors, but do whatever you like. You can also change the picture that's used or the image that's used for the uh, background. So if I turn it back on here you'll see that um, the image used changes. Just pick whatever one you like. I normally stay with the default one, and you can change the intensity of the uh, of the image as well. Um, Image-based reflections. It probably you see more. Um, it becomes more relevant when you have a glossier surface like this. It's mirror-based. It looks more like a mirror anyway. I s typically stick with something that's less glossy. It gives me an, enough of a specular highlight that I can see the uh, the sharpness or the smoothness of the bevel. Um, and these channels become a little bit more important um, when you want to use Endu to create um, your own textures. And you can view them directly on your model. And if you want to import something other than a normal map, because Endu is uh, at the moment restricted to normal maps, it can convert normal maps into ambient occlusion or height maps for you by using this option here, Map Converter. Okay, and you can uh, you can start with a normal map and convert to any one of these options, or you can start with a cavity and convert to normal. Um, it's it's a great feature. Um, Substance Designer can do the same thing, and it's a little bit more real time um, and pretty fast. So use whichever option you like. A lot of people swear by this, and they love it. It's a great tool. Um, the great thing for you artists is you have options. That's the truth. So if you have these, uh, see these custom channels here where you can change the uh, the values and the intensities. Um, when you go to your uh, your suite menu option here and you open the 3D custom loader, you have the option to load your custom mesh, which we'll do in the next video. You have options also to load your albedo, which is basically a diffuse map, metal, specular, gloss, all these options. You can load them specifically from files using these buttons here, or whichever whatever open document you currently have in Photoshop um, you're working on. So right now a normal map, we can select normal technically and press this button and it'll load this into the normal channel in the 3D viewer. Um, it's a little redundant because we're using this option to do that right now. Sometimes the window disappears. There we go. Um, but when you're uh, making your own albedo map or specular or gloss map, um, any kind or own emissive, you can select this option when that map is open in Photoshop and it'll immediately send it to 3D. And then any updates you make, you have to select this option again to refresh. This is no auto refresh button at the moment to keep things quick. Okay, and then you also have some tools for uh, some post process effects. So you have field of view, you have um, uh, depth of field 
of course, lens flare, sunburn, vignetting, uh, lens dirt. So you can, um, it's a lot like Marmoset tool bag in some of the effects that you get here. And you get some uh, real time cast shadows as well if you have objects. Uh, and you may see that when we load our next mesh, we have objects uh, protruding out of others, so they'll cast shadows on themselves. And you get a pretty good, uh, pretty clean render. So you can use this for your concept work if you just want to stick with an endo. Uh, Dedo is a great texturing application, which we won't cover now, but it's, it's worth taking a look at too. Um, it, in some ways, it's, it's comparable to Substance Designer, but they have a very different approach from each other in the way that you create textures. But both can do a fantastic job. Whatever workflow suits you better. Okay, so um, let's uh, quickly discuss how, um, I guess, the method of creating uh, normals. So we have this uh, smart shape that we just created here with a rounded rectangle, and there it is in our layer right there. And this little square at the bottom um, essentially means it's a smart object, and in our case with this shape, it's a vector object. So it's using math to form the shape, not necessarily um, pure pixel information. And that's important because when, you, when you're doing designs, in, in this case some hard surface work, you can subtract or add to the shape to create something really unique that would be uh, rather difficult um, doing just with, just with pixels and drawing. So I just cre uh, selected a new polygon tool um, and I'm going to hold down the Alt key and when I do that, if you can see my cursor, when, when I hold the Alt key, a minus sign will appear next to it at the bottom right. Okay, and when I hold the shift key, a plus sign will appear. And I'm doing this before I left click, before I drag. So if I hold the alt key and then I left click on the image, it's going to subtract this shape um, from, from the one that I currently have selected. And they'll both be combined onto the same layer. Okay? And so you can create some unique designs like this. And you can do all sorts of cutouts. And so very quickly, um, you can create not just interesting designs, but it's non-destructive. And what I mean by that is, I'm going to cut out this shape here as well. And then I can select this node, Alt, and left drag over. And you select nodes by using the Select tool. The shortcut key for that is A. You can select these tools. See? And because this one here was a subtractive uh, shape, the duplicate I make will also be a subtractive shape. And so you can quickly create some pretty neat designs. Um, mechanical designs with some style, some flair, if you want to call it that. And, um, and the most important part about it is you can move these shapes after you create them, right? And change the overall design. You're not committed to pixels where you have to erase or use your paintbrush for everything. And that's that's helpful um, as you kind of figure out what kind of design you want. You know, if you're if you're dealing a lot with concept work, or even if you're following um, some uh, a concept artist's rendition of what you need to model or texture, uh, it's a great way to work. It really is fast. Okay, so that's the fundamentals. Um, in the next video, we, we'll go into some, something more sophisticated, like uh, importing our 3D model, um, creating repeatable patterns, um, because it's great when you can make all these designs, but it's even better when you can use this pixel information within Photoshop using selection tools and, and, uh, and other forms of, of creating images that you can, uh, you can complement this form and use what you've created to make something more complex. Okay, so in the next lesson we will get into that. I think I've covered enough about the basics of making shapes. Um, if I need, well, one thing I will go over is uh, this menu over here. I did skip this. So when you zoom in here, you'll notice that we have options. I already showed you that you can change the, uh, the direction of this normal slant. You can also change the curve that's used here. So right now, it's the default curve is linear. So you have a straight, sharp edge um, from where it's flat raised across this bevel, but you can essentially give the appearance of this being rounded or indented, basically convex or concave, just by using this curve option. And you, you get different effects depending on what you choose. Some you may like, some you may not. And some can be hard to see. For example, when I made that change, I'm not even sure that it registered. Let me try that again. Yeah, it's hard to notice a difference. What you can do is you can increase the bevel size, and that's what this, this option here, size, essentially will make this bevel wider, and it'll give the appearance of this, um, this indent of being uh, deeper. Slide that over to something a little bit more extreme. And you'll notice automatically that this bevel increased, and it gives the appearance of the object being cut deeper into the surface. Um, but in some cases, you may want a, um, a wide bevel, but you don't necessarily want to have this, um, this surface go too deep into your 
into your mesh. So you can change the depth option here, which will give the appearance of... It can be difficult to select at times. Pardon this. Drag this down. So it'll give the appearance of the indent um, of being a little bit more shallow. You can see. And sometimes you have to drop this feature way down to get something makes sense. There you go. You can see it change slightly, right? Let me bring that up. Contrast can have a similar effect if that's what you're going for. Essentially it'll, it'll uh, decrease, I think it decreases the contrast between these two colors. Um, so it'll, well, play with it and see if it's what you like. Um, opacity will essentially do the just that. It'll change the opacity of this layer so anything underneath it will show through. And in some cases uh, you want that feature. Um, we won't get into that now, I think, but uh, there's some great videos on Quixel's website where they where they discuss them and they show you where it, where it's valuable. A uh, smoothness is a feature that you may mo uh, use a lot. It does that very thing. It makes the um, uh, the bevel smooth up to the point of where your form is created. You'll still have a sharp edge here, but within within the uh, within the normal information, you'll have a more smooth and rounded edge. And you can modulate that intensity very easily here. All right? Again, it's non-destructive. Um, all of these changes um, apply to this normal layer. If you want to create a different effect, um, for example, I'll show you here. Uh, first, let me finish this list. Fall off will change the uh, the fall off intensity um, of the curve. I believe it's not one I use often. Anti aliasing is good if you have a low resolution texture or if you're uh, zoomed in pretty close on this image and you're trying to get some detail in and you have some jaggy edges. Um, the uh, Endu will do its best to smooth the edges to make the um, to give you a little bit more detail where you may have very few pixels to work with. And Z factor um, is used, from what I understand, to um, you can set a Z factor on a normal and you won't see any visual difference here. But when you convert the normal to a height map um, through Endu, it will uh, the Z factor will essentially change how high um, this normal will be. Uh, or this ob this texture will be in your height map. Um, and again, there's there's a great example of that on their website. It's not one that I use very often. Generally, if I do create a height map at all, I just do it in Substance Designer. Um, but this is still a very powerful tool to use. Okay, so we will create one more layer just as an example. Um, and before we before we do that, we're going to zip the layer that we're currently in. And what that'll do is really just save. Uh, performance for you. It'll reduce file size and it'll essentially compress all the layers that you have beneath it here. These are still smart objects. They're not, they've are not. they not been destroyed, but it's made a duplicate and essentially um, has a flattened rasterized image above it that's used just for viewing what you've already worked on. You can't edit it in any way. If you want to edit it, you have to unzip the layer again. Okay, so we will create one more normal layer. Uh, in this one, we will keep um, upward facing. We'll take a uh, an object here, maybe just a simple rectangle tool. Drag it on top of there, and sometimes uh, I've noticed this with Endo, um, it can be a little bit buggy at times, and this will happen. It'll create the uh, the object where I didn't want it. So real easy, I just hit Control Z. Try that one more time. There we go. Had to hit the refresh button by hand. Um, the 3D will automatically update when you're using these features here and making changes, but when you're drawing within the layer stack, you have to automatically, uh, or so manually, hit the refresh button there. If that makes sense. Okay, so we can change the normal information to our heart's content here. Um, maybe we can exper uh, experiment with the bevel size. So we'll, I'll increase the bevel size here, and then change the curve, and then maybe we'll get something that looks more interesting. So here you go. So you have a curve that essentially dips within the inside of it. And if I were to decrease the bevel size, you may not see the effect of that curve very well. Um, in this case you can, but you, you'll see that as you start to um, reduce the width of the bevel, you have less uh, pixels to work with, so your curves may not be as visible. I don't want to do that. But still, you can create a, a pretty nice design. A, a little lip around an edge, maybe a seal or a gasket, uh, if you're dealing with something mechanical. And your layer stack here is important, as it always is in Photoshop. So any normals that you have, for example, our, uh, our normal that is an upward-facing slant right here, is on top of our downward-facing uh, uh, layer. Okay, and you can see as I select the layer here, let me move this window closer so you can probably see the effect. As I select this group, you'll see the information here change when, I, uh, when I'm accessing the parent folder there. 
Okay, so you can make the changes there as you need to. And I will zip this folder, the top one. And if I move the folder down below, it it should it will behave as you expect in Photoshop, right? If I can do that properly, let me move that up. It's not doing what I would like it to here. Let me unzip both and make sure that I'm looking at it properly. Okay, so this layer that I have, that I just hid, um, I'll, I'll name it something that makes sense. Something simple like up. And what I generally do is organize my layers by the uh, by the normal style. So I may have a different shape on an entirely different part of my mesh, but I want it to be upward facing with a pretty low bevel. And I'll just add that detail on this up um, layer that I'm already using. It'll save on performance size, uh, performance and file size if you consolidate like that. And it can keep things a little bit more organized for you. Um, and we'll, I'll touch on some tips later on uh, the best ways to uh, to find the information that you're looking for. Um, once you have a few layers going and you're trying to edit um, uh, some portions of your uh, normal document that you uh, are having a hard time locating within your layer stack. Okay, so with this selected, you you can reorder reorder the uh, stack here, and so you'll see obviously as you'd expect the up layer is now hidden because it's behind the normal information on the down layer, so it's long no longer visible. You uh, you won't see any changes until you refresh three do. There you have it. Okay, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, it's it's fundamental Photoshop, but for some of you that uh, that still may be news. So in the next lesson, we'll go through um, importing the custom mesh that we have for this object, importing the UV island overlay so that we can see exactly where we're painting these objects, and um, getting into some more sophisticated using uh, uses of these shapes. Um, you can see how easy it is to create up and down um, facing normals, essentially cutouts. Um, but we'll we'll skip all this and we'll uh, the fundamentals of how to do that and we'll cover um, how to use some of the probably little known features of Photoshop for producing some patterns which are pretty common with mechanical objects. Okay, see you then.